Speaking of being burned this morning, I want to say I got up and I burned 2,400 calories. Praise God. When I got done, afterwards, my wife said, babe, next time you put brownies in the oven, make sure you do not fall back asleep. Yes. Yeah. Earlier in the week, I went in my garage and I had a dictionary from the time I was a kid. Somehow it caught fire and burned up. I I was at a complete loss for words. All right. Yes, yes. I don't know if you know, you heard the mall burn down. The only thing left was Kohl's. I guess they had a bakery inside and its business is toast. (laughs) Toast is a good thing. It's a good thing. My wife changed out a burned out light bulb and ever since then I've been walking in a new light. What's the common theme of my corny jokes this morning? Things that are burned. Things that are burned. And being burned can be a good thing or a bad thing, right? A lot of times we just think of it as being a bad thing, like to get burned is, is a bad thing. But, you know, it's one thing, like I said, to burn a whole thing of, of brownies to a crisp, but you burn them in proportion, and baby, they are so good. The outer edges with that little bit of burn on them, and they're kind of like that caramelized crispness, and I don't know how you do it, but if they can be burned on the outside and a little gooey on the inside, that's like the perfect brownie. A little bit of burn can be a good thing. You go, you go jogging and you feel all of a sudden a tight burn going on in your leg. You know what? That might not be a good thing, but you're lifting weights and you feel a burn wherever you're moving those muscles. That burn is a good thing, right? So when it comes to the burn in life, it can be bad or it can be good. And what I want to explain to you this morning as we preach is that this is the exact topic that the Apostle Peter is trying to get across to the Christians in the first letter of Peter at the second half of chapter 4. And so throughout the rest of this chapter, he's going to be talking about the burn. And that there can be a bad burn and a good burn, but he focuses on what it takes in order for the burn to be a good burn. Now, number one he starts off with is expectation. Everybody say expectation. Verse 12, that's where we're starting. We left off last time with verse 11 two weeks ago. We're starting for the rest of the chapter at verse 12 this morning. Paul writes to the church, and he writes to them with the word beloved. I love, or Paul, I said Paul, right? Peter, so used to preaching through Paul's letters. Peter uses the word beloved beloved. It's amazing to me, like you think of the disciples that walked with Jesus, his three closest disciples, James, John, and Peter. And if you know the writings of John, he constantly is calling his Christian brothers and sisters in Christ beloved. And here again, Peter is writing to his brothers and sisters in Christ, and he's trying to express to them, I want you to understand, beloved, I love you. And I want you to hear this. And he says, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. As though some strange thing happened to you. I want to give you two Greek words out of this verse real quick. The word fiery trial in the Greek is one word. It literally means burning, burning. Don't think it's strange concerning the burning. Everybody say the burning. That's what we're talking about this morning is the burn. The word strange there is the idea of strangeness, of course, but it's more than that because it's the idea that you would even entertain thoughts. It has the concept in the Greek of entertaining and hosting. So that you wouldn't, you, you, it's saying you don't host these thoughts. Not even don't host them, but, but then to even entertain them, 
You know that you can have thoughts come into your mind. You might even host those thoughts, but then you begin to entertain those thoughts after a little while. And so there's this depth in this word strange of do not host nor entertain thoughts of strangeness. It also means don't be struck with surprise. And it also goes to the depth that it means don't be staggered. Staggered. Don't entertain thoughts of it being strange when you get burned. Don't be surprised. Don't allow it to stagger your faith. And when are we staggered most in life? If you're a boxer, most often they're staggered most when they get caught with their guard down. And the same thing goes for Christians. You get staggered most when you are not expecting bad things to happen. And so what happens? We get burned. And because we've been burned, we get shocked. Like, really, this ha- like, what's going on? And li- like, why is this happening? There's this shock that you're dealing with, this surprise in your life. And then if you're not careful, you get stuck. Because the effects of the burn that leads to the shock causes you to get stuck in these thoughts of why is this happening? these questions of life. And instead of allowing yourself to go down that road as Christians, Peter's like pretty straightforward there, like pretty straightforward with this. Listen, if this ain't heaven, and I hope we all realize this ain't heaven, then don't get shocked when hell shows up. That's what he's trying to get across to the church. In the context of this writing, some theologians believe that he wrote these words around A.D. 64. A.D. 64. It was at the beginning of persecution. The term Christian is used only for the third time in the Bible right here. The term Christian was most often looked at when it was used as a negative thing. It's something that people pointed out in the context of persecuting them. Those people are Christians. Originally in the book of Acts, in different places, they're known as the way, followers of Jesus. But the term Christian was originally a negative concept. Like those people are Christians, they need to be persecuted. And it would be within this time frame that persecution was beginning to spread in a great way throughout the Gentile nations. And specifically, Rome would be burned down and the emperor Nero would blame the Christians so that he wouldn't have to take the blame himself. And pretty soon, Christians would literally be be being burned as candles, human candles, in his garden parties. Don't fear the burning is what he's writing to them. To them, it means something much more than what it does to us today. If they weren't expecting a fiery trial as Christians, then the burn might end up incinerating their faith. So he's saying, you've got to expect. Expect. Now listen, it's all based upon expectations. I'm not saying, though, in expecting that bad things are going to happen in life, that that means we all have to become pessimists. On the flip side, you could become an eternal optimist. Like, bad things are going to happen. Yeah, I look for bad things to happen all the time. It's okay. Life's going to be great no matter what. I don't have to be stuck in the negative side of always looking for bad things to happen, but I have to be aware all the time that bad things can happen no matter what goes on in life. Life is not heaven on earth right now. And let me ask you this. When it comes to expecting things to happen, Have you, like, ever done anything bad and then you know you're going to have to answer for it? You can go in, deal with it, be super defensive, fight back, lie about it, whatever you might do. I don't know if you were a kid and you knew that you're going to have to go home and get answer to your parents. Uh, Husbands, you all know what I'm talking about, right? There's just those times where you know that you're going to have to go home and face consequences. And And whenever you get to those places in life, whatever the circumstances are, 
Have you ever just went in and thought, you know what? I'll just go in and eat crow. Sometimes it's better just to go in, admit the facts, eat crow, and it seems like when you do, like it's just that much easier. Because I'm expecting what's going to take place. And, and the truth is, I don't know exactly the details of what will happen, but whatever happens, I'm expecting things to happen. And in expecting those things to happen, like, I already know, so just go ahead and hit me with it. It's going to be okay, and we can get through this, and then we can just start working through it, right? Because there's an expectation that I've got to do this. This is what's going to happen. We're going to work through it in the end, and in the end, it's all going to be good. And when you do that, when you have that mindset of expectation, it changes things in your life. It changes the bad things that happen to you in life because you have this, if you, if you would, a positive expectation that bad things are going to happen in life. Now, what I want to say is that what I'm talking about in the context of being raised as a little kid or a husband not doing the best things and having to go home and answer for them, that that's not even close in comparison to what Peter is talking about here in Christians being burned for their faith. However, the point is that Peter is trying to remind us we're all going to go through the fiery trials of life. We're all going to have to deal with the burn. The difference between it being a bad burn or a good burn is when it is done with expectation. Expectation. Point number two is proportion. Everybody say proportion. The value of the burn, whether it's good or it's bad, depends on the proportion of the burn. Verse 13 says, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you, for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part, he is blasphemed, but on your part, he is glorified. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's suffering. Rejoice. What, what is Peter saying to rejoice in? Not the suffering itself but in being with Jesus in the sense that it should be a privilege to be counted with him. You know who's writing these words? Peter. You know what's ironic is that if you know Peter's story early on in his growth in the faith when he was but a follower of Jesus, a disciple, he's walking with Jesus for Three and a half years, and at the time of Jesus' arrest, Peter has the glory of being counted as being with Jesus. He is one of them. However, at the time, Peter wasn't what wasn't where he is now in his faith. And instead of being joyful at the fact that he was counted as being with Jesus as a blessing. He denied being with Jesus because he feared the consequences, the depth of the suffering that might come to his life, the proportion that he may have to face in knowing Jesus. And so rather than saying he was close with Jesus, in proportion, he separated himself from Jesus so that there was very little proportion of Jesus in his life because he may know that may have known that that would dictate the proportion of the consequences that he would have to face. But what Peter has learned in life, having walked with Jesus and then become an apostle for the kingdom of God, for Jesus' kingdom, is quite opposite that we should learn his wisdom here, that if you suffer for being a follower of Jesus, he's saying, no, listen, don't do as I did, do as I say. Rejoice in the fact that people see enough of Jesus in you that they count you as being in him. 
And in that, his spirit, they say, rests upon you. It's like proof that his spirit is with you. I also want you to notice this, that sometimes when we get beat up through the sufferings of life, that we want to, we want to just make it all about us. We whine and we cry and I'm the victim and everyone pay attention to me. I want you by me. I want you to take care of me. I need you to feel my sorrow, to feel my grief, to feel, and we make it all about us. But notice what Peter does to the Christians who are suffering. He doesn't say rejoice to the extent that you partake of your sufferings. He says rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings. Like they're not even your sufferings to be a victim about. What you're actually suffering is the sufferings of Christ. And what we need to understand as followers of Jesus is that the world put Jesus on a cross over 2,000 years ago and they are still trying to persecute and kill him today. The only difference is if you have Christ in you, if you really have Christ in you, they've got to go through you to get to him. Similar to a lot of the Apostle Paul's writings, you know that word rejoice. We're not rejoicing in the fact that we're getting beat up. We're rejoicing in the fact that we're a gatekeeper for Christ. Like people come to Christ through you because you have Christ in you. People can come to Christ, or they, they may even uh, come to Christ because you have Christ in you, because you're showing them who Jesus is inside of you, but they may also attempt to punish Christ because you have Christ in you, right? And, and if they do attempt to punish Christ, what Paul is saying in these verses is that on their part, when they do that to you, they're blaspheming Christ. But on your part, Jesus is being glorified. Two things are taking place when we have the ability to rejoice in the sufferings of Christ. They're blaspheming him, and yet Jesus is being glorified because we have the ability to still have joy in those sufferings. But the key word in these verses is extent. Extent is what will help determine whether it's a bad burn or a good burn. In the beginning, I talked to you about brownies to the proportion that they are burned, to the extent that they are burned, like they can be good or bad if they're burned just a little bit. But in the kingdom of God, it's all about being burned completely. If I am on fire for Jesus, the more on fire I am in the song that we sang, when the fiery trials come, all they're going to join is the consuming fire that's already taken place inside of me, right? Right? So the idea of extent is in proportion to, meaning the extent or proportion that I have joined together with Jesus. The closer I am to him may also play a role in the proportion that I share in his sufferings, in his name, that I suffer in his way, which then leads to the proportion of joy that I'll have at his return. Proportion of relationship can be equal to the proportion of sufferings, which is equal to the proportion of joy. How many want to have great joy in life? Yeah, not very many of you raised your hand because you know what I'm saying. You want to be somebody who has the ability to celebrate great joy in life. The greater joy that you're able to celebrate is usually directly linked to the greater sufferings in your life. It's like this, if somebody teases you because they know that you're a Christian, you know, you'll be happy to have somebody step in and defend you, right? Makes you feel really good. But if you get beaten, tortured, and put to the edge of death, how much more will you rejoice when your defender comes to your rescue? In proportion to the value of the burn depends on the proportion. You want a good burn? Then burn for Jesus. Completely burn for Jesus. Number three, avoid 
burning yourself. Avoid burning yourself. Everyone say self-inflicted. Verse 15 says, Peter writes to the church, he says, let no, none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evil an evildoer, or as a busybody in other people's matters. What's Peter doing right here? Quickly, he's just acknowledging the fact that not all suffering is in the name of Jesus. Somebody hear that? Not all of your suffering is in the name of Jesus. In fact, what he's saying is that sometimes our suffering comes from our own name. There's a lot of times I might suffer in life because I'm suffering in the name of Corey. It's self-inflicted. And what I want to drive home about this chapter is that Peter is not referencing suffering. He's not referencing suffering in general. Not that he's not talking about starvation in the world. He's not talking about people battling cancer. He's not talking about somebody that you know dying. He's not talking about the general evils of the world. And to be even more clear in that, he is definitely not referencing when we bring suffering upon ourselves because we have made bad choices in life. We understand, like when he starts writing in this context, we understand about the suffering that might come from being a murderer. Yeah, of course, you should suffer. That's what we think when we're like that, right? That guy's a murderer. He killed people. He needs to suffer. We understand when he's talking about suffering for being a thief. We understand when he's talking about suffering for evil doing. But then, should we really be surprised when he throws in that list the word busybody? Huh. What's a busybody? Y'all know, somebody who's always poking their nose in people's business. But I know none of you would admit to being that kind of person, so let me put it to, to you this way. You enjoy hearing gossip. To the, to, the, to the effect that you may even seek it out in conversation once in a while. Oh, yeah. You get a little thrill out of the gossip about other people's lives. Makes you feel good to know what the gossip is that's going on around you that you always have an opinion, and that you've always got something to say about what's going on in other people's lives. But can you imagine that busybody is right up there in Peter's list next to murderer? Somebody say, dang. <laughs> busybody. Murderer. Murderer, busybody. And of course we know that when it comes to sin in general, people suffer. We all suffer because we all have sin. There, there's consequences that we deal with in the, own, the sin that's in our own lives. But we shall not put that upon Jesus. It is not for the sake of Jesus that we're suffering. But check this out in verse 16. He says, yet... Yet, let's differentiate these things. Yet, if anyone suffers as a Christian, everybody say, a Christian. He's not talking about the fact that you're suffering for the general senses of pain and suffering in the world. He's not talking about the sense that you're suffering because of your own stupidity in life. He is talking about suffering as a Christian, being in the name of Christ. And if you are suffering as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. So a bad burn or a good burn is determined by the cause of the burn. Don't burn yourself. Number four, purification process. Purification process. A good burn is always determined by the purifying process. Verse 17, for the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Now, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? I've heard this preached a lot of different ways before. Most often in a turn or burn sermon, 
in a way that is meant to scare people in the church into making sure that they are living right. But I want to give you a little bit different perspective of these verses today. Because a lot of people will read these verses out of context. And out of context, you're going to read them as judgment is coming to the house of God. Meaning that God is going to judge believers. That God is going to discipline them for their sin. Now listen, that does happen. We do wrong things. There are consequences for the things that we do in life. That God does discipline his children. You don't have to go far in the Old Testament to see that his chosen people faced a lot of discipline in life. But what I want you to understand is that when you read this verse in context of the chapter, of the book, in fact, it does not seem to fit that idea of God being the one that is judging the church for all the wrong that they are doing. In fact, if you read the whole theme of 1 Peter, it does not seem to fit the idea that God is coming to judge his church because of all the sin in their lives. What is this whole book, whole letter about, First Peter? It's about persecution that is coming to the church because they are following after Jesus. It's about a persecution that is unjust. It's about a persecution upon a people that they can literally see who those people are and say that's a Christian in the negative sense. Not because they're a bunch of rampant sinners. But just the opposite. If Peter was talking about how bad the church is, then he would be continually scolding them. Now, don't tell me that in the New Testament, throughout the epistles, that there were authors like Paul who was continually scolding the churches. Or John in the book of Revelation in the first few chapters. Where the church needs discipline, the writers were afraid to speak discipline to the church. You guys all need to repent, come back to Jesus, and get your lives right. But that's not what Peter is describing here. In fact, the flow of Peter's argument starts in verse 16. There are going to be people outside the church who bring suffering into your life. Expect that. The people are going to be judging you. Expect that. And I'd say that Peter is referring to suffering brought on by people outside the church because he's talking about suffering, what we just read in verse 16? As a Christian. Not only is he referencing the word Christian, but he just previously differentiated between those who will suffer for their sins and those who are suffering for being a Christian. Y'all following me? Because I know there's some old timers here that probably heard this preached in just the way I described when I started this verse. He's very clear to separate the two and then begin to talk about this. He goes on in verses 17 and 18, and and he's talking about those who do not obey the gospel of God, right? Verse 17, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Verse 18, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? But when he's talking to those who are Christians, Christians, in verse 17, he brings us back to the idea of verse 12, in that these trials, even though they're coming through unbelievers, they're being used by God not as punishment, but to test. He says to try you in verse 12, to prove you, to purify you. Like, he's not even necessarily wanting to see himself, whether you're a true follower or not, but he is trying to allow other people to see who are true followers. God already knows the heart. This is for the world to see. Judgment begins with the house of God, with Christians to purify the house of God in order to prove who is really of the house of God. The flames of the fiery trial, they show where people really stand, don't they? Are you, are you the wheat or are you going to be the tear? Are you going to be 
the weeds of the church, right? Are, are you going, are you the real Christians or are you the apostates? Are you, you know, the sheep? Are you a wolf in sheep's clothing? What are you? And guess what separates every single one of those? When the fiery trial comes, when the burn happens. Think about this. You know that in Jesus' ministry, we think about his suffering, persecution, and death. Like the only time we really relate to that persecution is in his death. Think When you think about the sufferings of Jesus, what do you think about? Him dying on the cross. Could any of us withstand the three and a half years of ministry that Jesus went through? Do you not realize that before he ever went to the cross... He was being poked and prodded for three and a half years of ministry. To have been made fun of, to have been ran down and gossiped about, to have your family reject you, to go in your hometown and have them blow you off as just being some phony, just some kid down the street, to having other religious leaders constantly be questioning you and against you like throughout all of those years Jesus suffered persecution ridiculed for who he was knocked for who he was degraded abandoned verbally abused they could not stand him and if you were a follower of Jesus in that time frame guess what you would have endured to you would have had to have dealt with the fact that the person you say you believe in, the person that you're following, is constantly getting questioned, doubted, and beaten down with people's words. It would have caused you to question, to doubt. You would have had to have faced some fiery trials in your own life just in following after Jesus. And you know the fiery trials that came to the disciples' life? You can see the separation. Who were the real disciples and the 12 disciples? Well, I can tell you one who wasn't. And I truly believe it was the fiery trial that separated him. When the real pressure came, Judas was exposed for who he really was. When the real pressure came, he did not trust Jesus, but he put his trust in himself. He was willing to make a deal. Devil went down to Judas, and he was willing to make a deal. And the devil won. But then you can look at Peter's story. Jesus forewarned Peter. Maybe half the battle was that Peter, after that, had an expectation. It's quite possible that we would look at that and think, you know what, he still walked away, he was doing his thing. But I don't think he ever completely left Jesus right here. He loved Jesus, but it was through that process, that trial, Satan has asked to sift you. That Peter was purified. That he came to a place that he could trust God without borders. And that he did well in serving Jesus through serving the kingdom of God. The fiery trial, the burn, separates the bad from the good. And we may ask, is that really fair? Because aren't we all about what's fair in life? Verse 17 comes from Peter, but do you know in verse 18, he actually quotes Proverbs 11.31. Verse 18, he says these words, If the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? I want you to actually notice something. Like, you may read these verses with fear. Maybe a holy reverence for God. You know that if you're scarcely saved, you better draw near to Jesus. There's nothing wrong with that. Maybe if you don't even know if you're saved, that there should be a fear in your life that, hey, I better get things right because if you're scarcely saved, then where does that leave me, right? There's nothing wrong with that. But what I want you to see in these verses is actually the hope. Notice the comfort that Peter actually aims to give in these verses. Because we might say something like, okay, I understand what you're doing through the hatred and the persecution of the world in us, but what about them? 
What about the person who's constantly making fun of me? What about the person who's constantly treating me bad? What about them, God? Have we ever done that before? What about them? Because this is unfair. This isn't right. I have to go through this. But what do they have to go through? What about the persecutors, those who seem to hate you, to revile and reject you and reject us? And Peter responds by paraphrasing from the Proverbs to assure us this, that God will not be mocked, that his people will not go without vindication. This is another way of telling us that we don't need to be in the business of vengeance or worrying about what is fair in life, about what's going to happen to those who hate us. It's a reminder that God will take care of even them. Yes, we may face fiery trials while our lives are here upon this earth, but theirs, their fiery trial, will last for an eternity. An eternity. The burn's value is determined through what happens in the purification process. A good burn happens when you make number five, the final point. When you learn to make a deposit with the creator. Verse 19 says, therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit. Everybody say commit. Commit their souls to him in doing good. Say doing good. Like when suffering happens, you've committed your soul to God. That does not mean that you still decide that you're going to do bad things, but that in that committing it to God, that you're going to continue to do what is right in his eyes as to a faithful creator. Now, two things here. Notice that Peter uses the word creator. Everybody say creator. Say creator. He could have said a lot of different things. He could have said, the will of God, commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful deliverer, right? Delivering them from evil. He could have said, commit your souls to a faithful healer because God is our healer. He could have said, commit your your soul to a faithful provider because God is ultimately our provider. But he did not use any one of those words that describe who God is. Rather, he used the word creator. And in describing who he is as the creator, he said that he is faithful. He is the faithful creator. And I personally think that Peter did this because creator reminds us that God is in control that he is sovereign, that that he has made all things, that his word says he sustains all things, that he designed his creation with a purpose. And his creation is not just the earth that is out there, but his creation is you, and it's me, and it's the person sitting next to you, and it's the person in the street. He has created each and every one of us, but specifically for those who will commit themselves to him. He has a purpose and a design for you. He has a purpose and a design for his church. Even in all the suffering that happens in this life, he knows what he is doing because he is all powerful and he is still all good. And so in the word commit, by implication, it means to deposit something. To commit to him means you're making a deposit as into a trust. And it's for your protection. So all of our trial and suffering, all of it, every particle that you go through in life is under the sovereign hand of God. And therefore, Peter's trying to get them to understand you need to learn to relax and rejoice because in your sovereignly shepherded suffering, you are entrusting your soul depositing your well-being to your faithful creator. Faithful to what? He's faithful to himself. Understand the importance of that. He's faithful to his own word. He's faithful to his promises. He's faithful to the nature of who he is. 
He is faithful to his steadfast love and his infinite mercy. He is faithful to his own intention to finish what he began inside of each and every one of us. He is faithful to his own divine insistence on in loving you perfectly and completely. And if these three things are true, that God is totally sovereign, that God is for you, and that God is totally faithful, then not only can we move from a place of fear and doubt in the sufferings of life, but we should be able to move in faith and joy. So what could go wrong when the burning takes place? Nothing. Nothing. If it's expected, we understand the proportion 100%. It's not self inflicted, but that we're being purified and that we can deposit the value of who we are in His trust. It'll be a good burn.